Okay, so let's look at another example here to, re to illustrate um, another branching point in utilitarian theory. So the, the dog and the lifeboat example um, is, illustrates the branch between um, utilitarians like Bentham who think that all pleasures are the same wherever they are, whether in animals or humans children or adults and no matter how they're produced and that by the way was Bentham's response to Aristotle's argument um, and Kant's argument as well that pleasure isn't good if it's produced in a bad way and Bentham just simply responds well the action that produced it might not have been good but insofar as it's a pleasure it is good all pleasures are intrinsically good Bentham thinks um, and so uh, therefore every time they show up they're good even if they weren't that doesn't mean that the action that produced them was good okay so um, now uh, so that first branch was between those who think um, that all pleasures are the same and those who make a distinction between intellectual and sensual pleasures and weight them differently in one's calculations of the goodness or badness of an action. And this second example is also going to illustrate a branching point um, between kinds of utilitarian theory. So let's set the example up. Now suppose I told you I had a neighbor who was 91 years old and was a shut-in, so bedridden, never gets to leave the house. Suppose that this person has no family. All the family died in a tragic skiing accident in 2007. Now suppose this person is in great pain, suffering from a terminal illness like pancreatic cancer, which is extremely painful and um, has a 0% of survivability. The person is 91 anyway, so um, the, the time is running short. It's a terrible arthritis. No one comes and visits this person. They have no plants. They have no animals. They're living um, the end of their life in terrible agony. Now, of course, there's a hospice worker who comes and visits this person maybe once a week or something like that um, and just basically flips them over in their bed so they don't get bed sores and um, make sure that the bedpan and stuff like that is emptied. So no human contact, uh, no pets, no plants, but a deep distrust of banks and keeps $1 million in cash in a pillowcase in the closet. Now, of course, you just learned about utilitarianism, so you start thinking to yourself as follows. Look, no one knows about this money, right? Well, suppose that I had a million dollars. Let's suppose that I donated 90% of that to charity. Even if I donated 90% of that money to charity, I would still be left with $100,000 to spend as I want. And I don't know about you, but $100,000 seems to me like a lot of money. So what I do is I decide I'm going to kill my neighbor, steal her money, donate the 90% like I just discussed, and then use the rest to throw a huge party for myself and my friends. Now this looks like a moral action, right? I mean, what's immoral about it? Um, sure, I'm killing this person, but she's suffering anyway, so her death um, is going to end her suffering. You might look at that as, uh, so that's not increasing suffering at least. And nobody's going to miss her really. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the hospice nurse will lose a client, but she was going to lose a client anyway. She is a hospice nurse after all, who's used to working with dying clients. Um, now, so there doesn't seem to be a lot of suffering produced by my action. And in fact, there's a lot of happiness, pleasure that's produced by my action. Now, of course, I'm going to have some suffering killing an innocent person in her sleep. Isn't exactly, you know, how I thought my life was going to turn out. So it's not going to produce any pleasure in me. So there's some psychological trauma, maybe some guilt and so on. Um, so that, that has to be taken into consideration. But think about the pleasure that's produced uh, Overall, so I donate this money to charity, so Oxfam or something like that, and they use, um, I mean, uh, it's almost a million dollars, right? Nine, nine tenths of a million. Um, and so that's a lot of money. They can produce a lot of good in the world. And of course, I have $100,000 to spend on this giant party that I'm going to have a lot of fun with. I'm going to destroy the brain cells um, that house the memory of the murder. So overall, the more happiness is produced than unhappiness, the action looks moral. 
In fact, it's even worse than that. It seems like... Um, so one thing you might think is, well, maybe it's permissible, but that doesn't mean you have to do it. But you wouldn't blame someone who did do it. But, of course, the theory seems to say, well, of course you blame someone who didn't do it. If you had a chance to promote, produce all of this happiness and you didn't do it, what kind of person would you be? Seems immoral. But, of course, a lot of people think that something has gone wrong here. Um, because my neighbor is innocent and she doesn't deserve to die. Now notice that on a Kantian view, this kind of behavior is ruled out automatically. You're not allowed to treat another person merely as a means to an end. And you would be treating this person clearly as a means to an end in this case, the, the end being um, uh, all the happiness, pleasure that you're going to produce, and the means being you're killing her. So she's innocent. She doesn't deserve to die. Um, the categorical imperative says it's always wrong to take the life of an innocent person um, or a person who doesn't deserve to die. Um, so all uh, of those things are immoral. So it's immoral in this case. Now, the utilit some utilitarians have felt the pull of this even though they're utilitarians. <clears throat> and male is one of those. So, Mill discusses a problem like this in his work on, on this case, and he doesn't very clearly make a distinction between what's called later act and rule utilitarianism. That labeling actually comes from Rawls's work on utilitarianism in his early part of his career. Um, so act and rule utilitarianism aren't clearly distinguished by Mill himself. They're not distinguished in his theory very clearly, even though he, in one moment he talks as though he means one thing, and in the next moment he talks as though he means the other thing. Okay, so what is the difference? Well, act utilitarianism is just the one that we've been discussing this entire time. What you do is you take every action individually and ask of that particular action, does this action promote happiness overall or not? In some instances, the action may maximize happiness, but in others it may not. Now, okay, so that should be um, a familiar point by now. Now, a rule utilitarian considers not particular actions, but rather rules. So... An act utilitarian says, does this particular action maximize happiness overall? The rule utilitarian says, does the rule, do not take an innocent life, maximize happiness when it's followed? Now, what the rule utilitarian is interested in is whether or not, if this rule were generally followed, would it maximize happiness? In other words, if people followed this rule, would more pleasure than pain be produced? If the answer is yes, then people should follow the rule. Even on cases where following the rule doesn't maximize happiness in that particular instance. So the rule utilitarian will argue as follows. Take the rule. It is wrong to take an innocent life. Ask the question, what would the world be like if everybody did that? Took the life of an innocent person to further their goals? Well, be a lot of murder, bad chaos, consequences, terrible, bad, ick. Happiness overall would decrease, lots of suffering, fear, society crashing, etc., etc. Therefore, this rule is one that ought to be generally followed. Even if there is a case where breaking the rule will maximize happiness in the short run, the argument claims that overall in the long run, following the rule maximizes happiness and so ought to be followed even in cases where breaking it would promote happiness in the short run. In the long run, murder always decreases happiness. Now, obviously, you can see the sim, or hopefully, I uh, one hopes 
that you can see the similarity between rule utilitarianism and Kantian deontology. So rule utilitarianism tries to get the best of Kant's theory without the focus on motivation. In fact, as you well know by now, the utilitarians think that you can only be motivated in one way, by seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. So according to them, it's impossible to do what Kant wanted. Kant wanted us to be motivated by one's duty. And in fact, Kant thought that people who are motivated the way that the utilitarians think they are were acting selfishly and not morally. So they clearly can't be focused on why you're performing the action. But nonetheless, they want to preserve as much of the intuitive stuff as they can. So what we do is we think about, as we just saw, we think about universalizing a maxim but instead of instead of looking for some contradiction and therefore deducing some formal flaw in the maxim itself, what we do is we look for the consequences of the maxim being universalized. If the consequences are bad, then the rule is one that ought to be followed overall. But whether we follow it or not, our actions are good if they conform to it, no matter why we did it. Right? It doesn't matter why we're following the rule, as long as we're following it, and that rule overall produces happiness. Now, if we do it because we don't want to be punished, then our action is still good. The motivation for the action is irrelevant, as we've been saying. So, rule utilitarianism, like I said earlier, is like the categorical imperative for psychological hedonists. So here's a common sense way of sort of illustrating the difference between act and rule utilitarianism. So suppose that you're out in the middle of nowhere driving around in Connecticut. You got a stoplight. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. Now, you're sober. You're not out drunk driving. You're just, you know, taking an early trip or coming home or something like that. Um, no one is around. Everything is quiet. If you've been to Connecticut, yeah, you'll know what I'm talking about. Now, there are no police around. There are no cameras around. There's not a, a person or light within 10 miles of you. You're stopped at this intersection of these two, four, uh, uh, these two uh, long stretches of straight road. You can see either direction perfectly. You're at the red light. Should you wait for the light before you go? Or in this instance, would it be okay for, of, for one to just run the red light? You're not going to get caught. Now, most of us wait for the light. I assume. I mean... I know I wait for the light. I have in the past waited for the light. Because following the rule is generally a good thing. It's best overall if one stops at a red light. Now there are cases where you can run a red light. For instance, if there's a traffic cop telling you to. But overall, in the absence of those kinds of extenuating circumstances, one ought to follow the rule. Now, rule utilitarianism seems to get things right in the murdering case, but it seems to get things wrong in some cases where act utilitarianism gets things right. So there's an interesting tension between these two views. They can't both be right. Rule utilitarianism seems to capture some of what we think is right. Act utilitarianism seems to capture um, other parts of what we think is right, and so we don't really know what's uh, uh, going on here. But so consider this, the famous case of the ticking time bomb. So you know that there is a bomb hidden somewhere in LaGuardia College. You know that one of your classmates knows where the bomb is. And you know that the only way to get them to talk is to threaten their family perhaps even to kill one of their family members in front of this person in order to get them to talk. Now, the family member is innocent here. And they don't even know that your classmate has 
made the bomb or is a homicidal maniac. They're just an innocent bystander here. But you might wonder, so suppose this you're in this situation where you realize the only way you can get this person to talk is to kill this innocent person and then threaten to kill another member of their family. Nothing else is going to break them. They're too hardened. Would you kill this person or not? If you don't, then everyone in, at LaGuardia College dies. Some in thousands of people will die if you don't kill this one innocent person. Now, lots of people think that in that kind of case, you'd be morally justified to kill the person. The rule utilitarian doesn't think you would be justified um, since the rule never kill an innocent person is overall the thing which produces the most happiness, even if in this particular case it doesn't. They agree with the Kantian, right? For different reasons, of course, and that's what's interesting. See, according to Kant's view, you can't ever kill an innocent person because you're treating them as an end. Excuse me, not treating them as an end in themselves. We're rather treating them as a means, as a way of saving a bunch of people's life. Utilitarians don't really worry about that. You can treat people as a means if it's required. But of course, the real utilitarian thinks that there is ample empirical justification over the course of the history of humankind that killing innocent people overall never maximizes happiness, and so you ought not to do it in this case.